Did you know that the sandwich was invented by a compulsive gambler? That the Chinese fortune cookie is not from China? That the first hamburgers were thought to contain body parts? Since the earliest days, Americans have collected recipes from far-flung lands. Then we season and spice, bake and broil, simmer and scorch, and we reinvent. From cultures around the world, we gathered our favorite foods and we made them our own. Hot dogs and ice cream cones, hamburgers and pizza, fried chicken and the sandwich. The foods we eat have become emblems of America itself. They're fast, fun, and a little funky. Mustard pickle and onion, always. That's the old-fashioned one. Chopped liver, okay, corned beef, Russian dressing. I just love it. They're mass-produced and custom-made. Two on a plate. Where's the roll? Give me a plain cheese pie well done. And each food has an amazing story to tell. The story of American food is the story of American ingenuity, an uncanny ability to take food from somewhere else, bring it here, and make it, well, more interesting. Of course, no one did this better than America's immigrants, especially those who arrived in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Many came with just the clothes on their backs and something priceless, the recipes for their own unique foods. We are a mixture of the eating habits of the many cultures and the many peoples who have come together in the United States. We've made um, the cultural diversity of the United States part of ourselves in our everyday lives, and we enjoy doing it. Still, there wasn't always so much to enjoy. Imagine a world in which pizza didn't have cheese, where there was no peanut butter to go with your jelly, and where the hot dog was served, if we dare say, without a bun. The hot dog. An American gastronomical icon synonymous with American culture itself. No matter how you eat yours, with mustard, pickles, onions, or kraut, just about everyone likes hot dogs. At home, over the campfire, at the game, or on the beach. And the story of the hot dog is a very American tale, spiced with immigrant dreams, hard work, movie stars, and inspired hustle. The hot dog has an ancient and noble ancestry because undressed, the dog is really just a simple sausage, and sausages are as old as civilization itself. In ancient times, butchers needed a way to preserve and store precious meat to keep it from spoiling. Sausages were simple enough to make. Chop the meat fine, mix in pepper and other spices, squeeze it into a piece of animal intestine. After preserving it by smoking or drying, it could keep for months, even years. The ancient Greeks made sausage. Homer describes it in the Odyssey. The first Christian Roman Emperor Constantine tried to outlaw sausages in 300 AD because he thought they were too bound up in Rome's older pagan ways. No use. Constantine may as well have told his people to stop drinking water. But that's all ancient history. The humble hot dog as we know it dates from the 19th century when German immigrants brought over the sausage that was destined to become world famous. By the 1850s, the so-called Wienerwurst, or Frankfurter, after Frankfurt, the supposed city of its birth, could be found in New York's German groceries, the delicatessens. These sausages were usually beef with a little pork or lamb tossed in. One old sausage maker's trick was to add a little veal, which made the sausages plump up when they were heated. A hot dog special effect that is still familiar today. 
In the late 1800s, grinders were invented that could chop the meat into a super fine mixture. A hungry diner could chew and swallow a franc in under a minute, an early fast food. So now America had itself a real wiener. But before America fell hard for this Teutonic tidbit, there was still one crucial ingredient missing. The bun. And how it met the sausage is a tale of heated debate. Some say that the original meeting place was the one most commonly associated with the dog today, the baseball park. In 1901, a man named Harry Stevens sold ice cream at the Polo Grounds, home of the New York Giants. Legend has it that one cold day when ice cream wasn't selling, Harry Stevens had an inspiration. He ordered his crew to buy frankfurters from surrounding German shops. To make them easy to hold, he slapped them onto Vienna bread rolls. The new snack caught on. Some vendors called them Red Hots. Others nicknamed them Dachshund Dogs after the long, skinny German pooch. And hot dog lore has one man putting the two names together. The sports cartoonist T.A. Dorgan drew a cartoon having the vendor say, get your red hots, get your red hot dogs here. Now, no one has ever found this cartoon. Whoever named the hot dog, there's no question where the dog became famous. New York's Coney Island. And the man who started that association was German immigrant Charles Feldman. In the late 1860s, Feldman was a meat pie vendor on the skinny spit of land at the bottom of Brooklyn. And according to Coney Island history, Feldman was the first one to put a dog in a bun. He got nervous when his competition started selling sandwiches, which were easy for the busy customers to eat on the go. So Feltman rigged a small charcoal stove to his wagon, boiled frankfurters, and then wrapped them in toasted buns. Within 10 years, Feltman's Coney Island wagon had grown into Feltman's Ocean Pavilion Hotel and Restaurant. It was a huge success, serving 7,000 people at once, many buying francs at a dime apiece. Then, on a momentous day in 1915, the hotel hired a young roll slicer named Nathan Handworker. These were the days before automation, so every roll had to be hand sliced. My father, when he started out, the roll, you know, came in, he had his hand in, and he had to use a knife. And, you know, he was pretty fast, he was pretty good in it. Handworker was a Jewish immigrant fresh from Poland. He worked hard, and he was liked by everyone. And when a couple of the regular customers at Feltman's, a pair of struggling actors named Jimmy Durante and Eddie Cantor, told him he should start his own shop, Handworker considered it. He saved his money. One story says he did it by eating nothing but the hot dogs he could get for free at work. And after saving $300, Nathan quit Feltman's for the chance to take his own bite out of the American dream. Nathan's Coney Island hot dog stand opened on a corner just down the street from Feltman's in 1916. Nathan set out to make a better hot dog by first changing the blend of spices. And my father asked my mother to see, you know, she was the cook in the family in those days, and he asked her to see if he can develop a spice formula that he can give to the spice manufacturer who sold to the meat people and manufacturer of the hot dogs. And she developed it. It took a while. And they finally said, this is the taste we want. Nathan's dogs were a little more peppery than Feltman's and a little juicier. They were all beef, they used lots of pungent garlic, and they were wrapped in a natural intestine casing, which made them crunch when you bit them. But most importantly, Nathan sold them for just a nickel, half the price of a Feltman franc, the first price war in hot dog history. And wouldn't you know it, it backfired. A lot of people, when he opened up with a five-cent Frankfurt and his Feltman's was 10, they were all worried. What kind of food do you give with a five-cent Frankfurt? In the early days, cheap hot dogs were being made out of dubious bits and pieces of pigs and cows. Nathan was using quality beef, but how to convince people of that? He offered free pickles, free root beer, but nothing worked. Finally, he came up with one of the greatest publicity stunts ever. 
He offered free meals to doctors at the Coney Island Hospital on one condition. They show up at his stand wearing their white lab coats. Once the public saw doctors eating at Nathan's, well, the health concerns over a nickel dog were cured. An important step in making Nathan's famous was the arrival of the subway in Coney Island in the early 20s and the building of the boardwalk in 1923. The beachfront was transformed into the so-called Subway Riviera. As beachgoers stepped out of the station, the first thing they saw was Nathan's. Now, no trip to Coney Island was complete without pushing your way to the block-long counter for a crackling, natural casing Nathan's. You just take a look at the subway, and you just see thousands of people coming off and walking to the beach. And if it rained in the middle of the afternoon and people would the people would be coming off the beach, everybody on the counter would say, they're coming off. <laughs> and you'd just be deluged and it'd be overflowing into the streets. And uh, it would just go on, it would seem like an eternity. The best of the griddle men at Nathan's could sell 60 hot dogs a minute. The hot dog's popularity surged. Hot dog! But the biggest day we had here, it was a very rough winter. People couldn't go out the doors. They were tied up. It was snowy and miserable. Then toward the spring, Decoration Day is the start of our season. Well, that Decoration Day, everyone just got out. And they, they couldn't stand to be cooped up anymore. And Coney Island was mobbed, absolutely mobbed. And we sold 52,000 francs for this that day. When the talented grill men plied their trade at Nathan's stand, magic happened. And that magic attracted some very familiar faces. Babe Ruth took his dogs with mustard, onions, and sauerkraut. It was whispered on the boardwalk that he ate 10 or 12 dogs between the games of a doubleheader. Unbelievable, but true. Celebrities who had survived on nickel hot dogs from Nathan's in their vaudeville days came home to Coney Island. He got every celebrity imaginable, and so in the mythology of Nathan's hot dogs, uh, Jimmy Durante and Eddie Cantor and all the famous celebrities who played vaudeville in those days went to the stand, gave him publicity. Now Nathan's really was famous, but the Hollywood glamour was only part of the hot dog's magic. It was the everyday folks lining the counter that really made the Franks so famous. The beauty of the American hot dog is it is a democratic food. It is served to everybody, no matter what the social level. By the mid-1960s, in a mere 50 years, Nathan Handworkers Company had sold 600 million hot dogs. Yeah. But the hot dog had one yeah. more door to knock on, the door yeah. to the American home. And that was opened by Oscar Mayer, Jr. Oscar Mayer gets hot dogs out of the ballpark and out of the, the street food category into the home, largely by marketing to kids in the 30s and 40s. The Meyer family owned a successful meatpacking business in Chicago. They were among the first to slap their company name on every package of meat they supplied to the supermarket. And they helped make the hot dog a favorite with the help of a publicity stunt. Oscar Meyer presents Wienermobile's On the Road. In 1936, Carl G. Meyer dreamed up the 13-foot Wienermobile. Internal combustion hot dog. He hired a midget actor, put him in a chef's outfit, called him Little Oscar, and sat him in the bumper seat. The Wienermobile spread the fame of Oscar Mayer and the hot dog through the appetites of children. It turned out to be the perfect food for campfire cooking and for young mothers. Hot dogs were pre-cooked, easy to prepare, easy to chew, and kids genuinely liked them. Oh, I'd love to be an Oscar Mayer wiener. that kids go shopping with their mothers. Get them to buy these hot dogs. 
Mom, I want this hot dog. So, of course, mothers give in. They don't want to hear it. The American dog itself was still evolving. Most of today's dogs don't have any skin at all. The meat is chopped and mixed, squeezed into a plastic casing, and cooked in the shape of a lid. And then the casing is peeled away, leaving the meat behind. And although most dogs are all beef, there are chicken dogs, turkey dogs, even some which harken back to the bad old days. There are some real old-time hot dog brands which will serve you things like cow lips, cow ears, pork snouts. You will see it, lymph glands. There are brands which do it. And that's the way they used to be made, once upon a time. Sleek and streamlined, plump and juicy. We all love a good hot dog. You might even say it's out of this world. And by the 1970s, hot dogs were. Literally, dogs were just one of the comfort foods sent by NASA into space to fulfill the astronauts' hunger for a taste of the good old U.S. of A. But the astronauts' dogs had to fly without their traditional co-pilot. There was just no room in the capsules for the yeast-risen buns. It's an American favorite that's thousands of years old, but you can get yours fresh in about a half an hour. Pizza, when we return to American Eats, history on a bun. It's okay, I, you know, it's not a live animal. It's not the shoes that you wanted. The Lexus, December to remember sales event. Honey, you gotta see this. Okay. You'll find values you never believed possible. You like it? A Ted. Oh, yes. <laughs> the December to Remember sales event ends January 3rd. Missing it okay. would definitely spoil the surprise. See your Lexus dealer. Every day in brilliant color. Get the picture with Fujifilm. All the way to the corner, girl, did you do a little do-si-do? Imagine calling the dance without worrying about your dentures slipping. Thanks to the all-day hold of Super Poly Grip, I can laugh and smile and take a healthy bite out of life. You know what I like about working at Office Depot during the holidays? Customers like Greg McCormick. He's so nice. His company makes peppermint candy canes. And he loves giving them out to just about everyone while he does his holiday shopping. He also loves saving money on everything he buys. Lucky for us, though, the holidays come only once a year. All that candy gets to be pretty tempting. Shop Office Depot, online or in our store. Thanks for shopping Office